All right, you guys, I would like to introduce you to Megan Fairchild. Just waiting for it to connect. Ah! Hey! Hey! <laughs> oh my gosh, I feel like I haven't seen you in so long. It's been forever. I had a baby since we last really saw each other. <laughs> I know. And we've been, we've texted and we've had, you know, chats, obviously, especially about baby things. Um, yeah. But, oh my goodness. And your baby's so big now. <laughs> I know. She's a year and a half. Oh, uh, yeah. It's been way, it's been way too long. That's How old is great. your baby? Oh, uh, he's almost 10. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. Where are you guys right now? We're in Manhattan. So oh, no. we are in. So you're you're not in. You were in Chicago for some time, but now yeah, you're so we, we full were in time Chicago Manhattan. For just a little bit, yeah. We're we're from okay. Manhattan. We're from Manhattan originally. So oh, okay. Yeah. So we basically just came back. <laughs> the prodigal, nice. the prodigal children always seem to return, don't they? <laughs> I, I'm not there right now, but I guess we'll go back as soon as we can. But yeah, how is it? Um, it's okay. I mean, we live in a relatively quiet neighborhood. Um, so it's not, it sort of seems like business as usual, sort of outside. Mm -hmm. Um, there's obviously a lot less noise than there is, even though there's generally low noise. Um, food is okay. You can get to the grocery store. Well, so my, I decided that we were all going to stay inside. My mother is older and, and I have exercise induced asthma, which for, for a long time I thought was going to be kind of a risk. Um, I just saw an article yesterday though, that perhaps it's not. So oh, that's great. So we'll see. Yeah. So we've been inside for a month now, um, without going outside except for to throw the trash. Uh, so you haven't been even to the grocery store? No. Good for you guys. So yeah. So we took our, our stay at home order very seriously. Um, and did our, you know, we've done what we can, right? Yeah. It's a little crazy, it's a little crazy making, but yeah, (laughs) but it's okay. It's all right. But how are you? Chats to keep in touch with people. I know. I know. I wanted, oh, Solange is here. There are lots of fun people that are listening this morning. (laughs) So basically, okay. So in case there's some people here that don't know, Megan and I met, um, a handful of years back now. I, I, I'm the worst with dates, but we met. I'm going to say it's 2016. Okay, 2016 in August in um, in in San Francisco. Yeah, and we were doing on the town with Michael Tilson Thomas with the San Francisco Symphony, and it was well, it was you and the entire Broadway crew that you had performed with right. uh, in New York. Plus on, you on on the town, and then it was plus me, right? So it was just funny. <laughs> It was this really funny situation. And I felt like I was walking into this incredibly well-oiled machine. And I was like, sorry, oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't, I don't know why I'm here. I'm so sorry. But you guys were the best. And you were so, so welcoming. And you were so warm and fun to work with. And then I, had all, I have all these great friendships from it. So right, right. I was just, so happy to meet you. That was a fun experience. I was nervous because it was like really quickly put together. And then... My, um, who, gosh, I can't even remember the name of the role. My madam, wait, what's, what's the name of? Dilly. Madam Dilly? Yeah. Is that her name? You know, the woman that's supposed to be my singing teacher? She oh, was yeah. like this famous opera singer, and I had to sing a song with her, and I was like, this is a nightmare. <laughs> that's the ah! So um, I was just a little intimidated, but um, I survived. No. Oh my God. I, well, I remember I felt, I felt like very, um, I felt sort of close to you that way too, because like you were coming in from the dance world, you know, and even though you had had right. like, a couple of, you know, a year at least to like get into the flow, but you did have that sort of feeling. I was like, okay, good. I'm I was not still the only an, one. an outsider. And we both can't come from classical worlds. Right. You know, right. which is different than the Broadway you know, yeah. world. So yeah, we're kind of like, no, I can't make a mistake. What do you mean? Mistake? Mistake? What? Right. No. No. Right. right. Exactly. 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 Yeah. So that's so fun. Aww. <laughs> so that I'm trying to like keep up with Solange. Is, yeah. Solange and I went to school. To, well, Solange and Sammy and I went to school together. And so this is really fun to see kind of everybody's little, little comments. So, um, 
<laughs> so basically, like, aside from talking about, you know, the situation at hand, which I think has been very obviously impactful for everybody, um, I've been talking with so many really kind of amazing, amazing people. And I have to say, like, my friends, you know, they're so Yeah, cool. I know. About, it's not, I've, about, I've been connecting with people, too. It's like, yeah. people, like, you know, we've been trying to go out for coffee for years. <laughs> this is finally happening. <laughs> right. I know. What's also kind of amazing is how little time there is, in fact, to get everything done. Right. Strangely, strangely enough. I, I agree. I seem to be really busy. I seem to be on all these Zoom chats, trying to get work done, trying to create projects, trying to figure out what the next step is moving forward, because I think that, you know, things have to evolve quite, quite quickly. Um, I agree. Yeah. And I'm sure that you're feeling that, too. So I was actually kind of curious Maybe for those who don't know, like, can you just tell a little bit about like how you got to where you are now and then, and how do you see things right now? And where do you think you're going to be going? I mean, how I got to where I am within the pandemic? Within your career, like within your, oh. within your career. Yeah. Yeah. Within your career, like how you got to where you are now and, um, and, and yeah. And how do you think this is going to kind of move forward or what are your sort of ideas about the evolution forward? Yeah. Um, well, I'm a principal dancer with New York City Ballet. I've, I got promoted really, really young. I'm, I'm originally from Utah, and I moved um, to the School of American Ballet to study at 16. And I did my junior and senior year out in, um, in New York and balancing the ballet and, and school. And um, got into the company at 17 in the middle of my senior year. Wow. And then, like, three years later, got promoted to principal, which was oh. incredibly overwhelming but I it was because there was a guy that was shorter and I, I'm like one of the shortest principals um and he needed a partner and he was really like he was like 28 and ready to go so I kind of like had to rise to the occasion so um that was you know now 15 years ago and um uh I after I just had a baby and and came back and had a a really great year of performing and it was really great to be back. Um, and suddenly I found myself busier than ever and I'm going to business school and I have a baby and then somehow I'm dancing more than I ever danced even before I had a baby. So I think that's kind of ironic. I didn't expect that to happen, but I'm, I'm happy to be busy. And then, and then this happened, which at the time that it happened, I was ready for a little chill moment. I was really, really tired. Right. Um, so I was like, oh, great. I can catch up on my homework. I can be with my baby more. And so those were all positives. And then, you know, we've been here for a couple of weeks now, yeah. almost like more than a couple months almost now. Right. <laughs> and right. it's starting to hit me. I had some friends in the business that we were, we, we would text people in my company at New York City Ballet. They would text me and, and they were really down. And, and I was, I was finding still, um, purpose, you know, I started a YouTube channel. I was like, I've got a lot of things I want to put out there. And I started doing interviews with people in my industry, things I've always wanted to do but never had the chance to do. And I like connecting like you, so it was kind of my, my way to do it. And then um, I listened to a lecture through my business school yesterday about how this is going to affect entertainment, media, and sports. And I got really, really depressed. Mm -hmm. And I... I just felt like, you know, like what's great is platforms like Netflix and stuff. They're set up really well for this kind of time, but like live performance, mm -hmm. this is not, this is not a sustainable situation. And so right. I just got really down for a minute, like feeling like, well, not to think like I'm in the wrong industry, but like, this is one of the unlucky ones. Like we have big challenges. How are we going to get through this? And I've really, really been thinking uh, what they, one of the things they said that was really interesting was um, this is going to, this time is going to act as an accelerator for whatever was kind of already going to happen. If you're in an industry that was a little bit slower, it might slow it down even faster. Or if you're in an industry that's a little more on the old fashioned side it's, and hasn't embraced technology so much, it will accelerate that. And so I've been really thinking that um, we're going to have to evolve into some type of digital platform. I and I, for both of our industries, I think they, I mean, you guys do like live Met stuff all the time. I think the ballet is even a little more, um, reticent to that. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know why, but, um, 
I think now is the time where we have to embrace it. It's like anybody that is part of our institutions that was nervous about it, you can't even go there anymore because we have to be adaptable. We have to evolve. If we want to still stay relevant, we have to make new content in the settings that we have. We have to find new ways to put it out there. And so it's kind of, I'm trying to stay as positive as I can about it because it's a moment where if we can all, you know, be creative, there is something to do. It's, I I don't want to get into a place where I feel like the way it was, is the only way I'll enjoy it. You know, live performance in a big theater, like not that I'm going to dance for people in my living room here, but like, Mm -hmm. you know, reach out by teaching, reach out by talking about what we do. Um, I think eventually we might evolve to some type of like rehearsal kind of style, digital content that we put out there. Cause we're going to have to try to do stuff without stagehands, without, um, without an orchestra, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're in the same boat, like stagehands and orchestras have incredible unions and you have to pay them prop. Like everything is, it's going to be quite the expense to involve them. So if we can still find a way to like do something like you guys can just sing next to piano, we can dance in the studio. Like there's something there that is worthwhile still. So I think we might evolve towards that. Yeah. I I completely agree with you that this is, is this is the catalyst that has to force um, those of us in the entertainment business coming from, like you said, more classical. um, uh, I want to call them like, habits in a way because they're really habits more than anything it's not that the classical ballet or or music world cannot come into the new sort of modern way of um of media but it's just i think out of habit perhaps out of a little bit of fear that they haven't done it full full hog right so yeah and and i think there's people in our industries that feel like that will take away from what it is that we do like, sure, and I think it, I, I think it will. I think live performance has its has its. Um, oh yeah, it, there is nothing like it, right? There is absolutely right. flat out nothing like it. But perhaps also there'll be an understanding of the value of it, and right. and when we are right. eventually moving out of this, and we can eventually bring our communities back together in an audience and on stage, the value of that will finally be seen for what it actually is. Because I think we've been struggling too. We've been struggling with the value of it. Um, And I think I have like a lot of thoughts right now about all of the sort of free um, art, right? That is being put out there. And I've done some of it myself. So it's not about, I'm not being a hypocrite when I say this, but I, I I do feel that if there is too much, too much uh, free uh, selling. Why would anyone pay for it? Right. Exactly. That we, in a way, um, makes it, makes it harder, you know, I think moving forward. Um, but it's very tricky because, you know, artists also are very much fulfilled and feel, um, it helps their legitimately like their health to perform and to give to the audience their craft. So it is a two way street. Um, but in any way, I think it's a super fascinating, it's a very fascinating time. It can be very emotionally up and down. Um, right. Yeah, yesterday I had a, my first really rough day because I'm kind of a person yeah. that just, I'm realistic and I take each day and I'm like, what can I do today? And right. and yesterday, looking at the bigger picture in this lecture, it really hit me. Like, I mean, they had this quote from some bio, some something, <laughs> that yeah. he said that um, it would be, you know, really naive to think that like big sporting event type things would not return until fall 2021. Mm. And when Mm. I read that, I just was like, you know, and I'm even really jealous right now of like sports because they're Mm. on TV. So like they can go in their little bubble and that's what they're thinking of doing with baseball, going into Arizona, everyone get tested and staying in a little bubble and like making, Mm. you know, a baseball season and they can be on TV and, and we just don't have that, um, type of platform yet. And, and I really, in my mind, funding, we don't have the funding for it. Either. Exactly. And to, that's to the get other, there. That's the biggest issue, I think, as it, well. It, it costs a lot of money to film all of, all of these yeah. things. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it would cost a lot of money to get all of us, you know, even if it were just SAB, for example, for all of you to go to one place to have to quarantine basically for two weeks first before anybody can right. do anything. So you're talking two weeks of nothing. 
you zero gain essentially and then to start working and then you're also putting yourself in a situation in which you're you have to be there like you can't leave unless you want to come back and spend two weeks waiting again right like and if, like what about your family and mm-hmm, exactly yeah, crazy exactly. I, exactly. yeah I I really I feel grateful that I'm working for a bigger classical company right now and I'm sure you do too I feel bad for more regional ballet companies I'm nervous for you know institutions that were, did not have a huge amount of like buffer going on as they went right. into this. And I, I know that that is the case for a lot of smaller ballet companies. So I'm just hoping yeah. that, you know, no one has to die out from this situation that we can all just hang in there and, right. and somehow get to the other side. So. Right. Absolutely. And I think what's interesting is, you know, you're in, like you said, you're in a great situation that you're with a large company. So the thing with the singers is that we are not connected to any companies. So we might have worked at the Met. Right, you're more contractual. Yeah. But we're contractual and we're, we're independent contractors. So we are actually in a very, so many are in such a serious situation. And, and we've been, I think part of the reason why there has been free content coming out of sort of a lot of our group has been to kind of inspire people to donate to like the Agma Relief Fund or this Artist Tree Relief Fund um, because these are singers who are not, and have not made a dime, I mean, including myself since mid-March, and are most likely looking at nothing for... So the first are you guys quarter. paid through 1099s through like a W-2? Because I know it's hard to file for unemployment if you're on 1099s. Right, correct, because we're not employees. So, so you get 1099s from the Met. Correct. Unless you are an employee, you get a 1099. So... I see. And this is all the business side I see. of it. But um, yeah. so it is, it is really tricky. I, many, many, many years ago, with uh, help of my accountants, who I am indebted to, to be totally honest, I started and I incorporated. Um, my brother did that too. So, yeah. So there is a, like that much more safety there, but I, it's not, it doesn't mean to say that I'm sitting here going, oh, I'm happy to have no work. Right. Definitely not happy right. and definitely not okay. So I'm, you know, right. teaching and we're all, we're all basically trying to do what we can. So that's right. the other side of it. I don't want to necessarily like talk about myself a lot. It's so boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do have more questions. I did have more questions for you, for you, if you were okay. interested. I'm actually really, really curious. Absolutely. Because I know, I just, I know how demanding it is as a dancer and I know how many hours a day you guys dance and it's so much like it's so much more than what we would be practicing even and we're all dealing with muscles so on pre pre this pandemic we're going to call it pp pre pandemic how many hours a day <laughs> how many right how many hours a day were you dancing um we start company class every day at 10:30 and it's an hour which is actually kind of short for a ballet class and then you can be rehearsed anywhere from like 12 until six o'clock. Oh, um, and you find out the schedule two days before and you just kind of like see the schedule and you go to the studios you need to go to. Some days you randomly have like five ballets you have to rehearse and you're like, you know, you get, you have to, after every three hours, you get an hour off, you get five minutes every hour. But um, basically that's enough time to run to the next rehearsal well, it's not enough time. Like I'm usually five minutes late yeah. if I have to go to a different studio and then put on a different pair of point shoes because you can't keep wearing the same pair hour after hour. I change a pair every, every hour. Like I, I cycle through like 10, 10 pairs at a time, but they have to be dry when you start a rehearsal. If they're sweaty and wet, like you just die and go over your point shoes. So, um, so yeah, I mean, sometimes I have just half an hour of rehearsal and sometimes I have like five. And then you might have the show at night and that could go all the way till 11, depending right. on which ballet you're in. So you're not dancing like, you know, two hours every night on stage. It's not like maybe right. being in an op- opera where you're in and out for the entire length of the time. You might be in the first half hour ballet, you might be in the middle half hour ballet or the last one. So, uh-huh. um, and then if you're in the core, you're in every ballet. So wow. they're, they are rehearsing all day long, and they are in the performance every night. So wow. for them, this is a huge change. For me, right. my schedule was really more based on what do I need today to get 
done what I have coming up in performances. And so my mindset is really more training based. So I feel like I can kind of transition well into this kind of scenario where I I just choose what I need to do. Um, Mm. I mean, obviously I show up to the rehearsals I need to show up to, but like, it's what I need. So I can show up and do like, it's like today it needs to be more of a rest day. I'm exhausted or so, so I'm very much like I've had to self maintain and self discipline my whole career as a principal. Um, Cause you're not really ever getting as much, you know, maybe you're getting too much rehearsal on the schedule. Maybe you're getting too little. And so you have to like, um, supplement to, mm. to take care of yourself. So I feel like I'm really in tune with what I need right now. I'm trying to do two things a day. So like yesterday I taught a ballet class for the school of American ballet and I couldn't see them on the screen. So oh. I just took it, I took it with them. Right. And so that was like an hour and 15 minutes of ballet in a small space. And then um, for the second thing, I chose to do a yoga class online Nice. So, like, I'm always doing, like, two things. Like, I'm at my parents' house, so there's an elliptical machine. I can do that. Oh, um, I have my Pilates teachers doing, um, you know, Zoom classes twice a week that, like, are the most painful things I've ever done. <laughs> so, I feel I feel okay. I've only put my point shoes on once in the last, like, you know, five weeks. Um, wow. I only have two, pa- two pairs here, and they died down. So, I ordered some glue so I can make them last. And, wow. um Eventually, I'll head back to New York where I'll, I have more point shoes. But, um, you know, if we're not going to dance for at least six months, it's okay to be a little bit of a break out of the shoe. And, and I always take advantage of these moments to heal anything. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, you know, my feet are resting and breathing right now. I'm still dancing, but I don't go maybe always up onto point. So, right. you know. so Yeah, it's so interesting because I guess my mind could have, you know, I could have thought of a bunch of different things, but you're the detail obviously is so fascinating and the point shoes, I mean, and the, and, and just, um, just the amount of time. Cause I guess I always have this, this image in my mind that you guys are just going, going, going all the time. Um, and so I was thinking, gosh, how do you, how do you keep that up essentially, you know, like, right now. Athlete, like every athlete, you know, and, and that's right. what you guys are. So, and there is that feeling of keeping it up, but also having a little bit of a break. And when do we know we'll come back? Because you know that month before everything opens up again, if it, if it happens in such a way, it'll probably be more like a slow trickle. But right. that there will be this unbelievable sense of like, oh, my God, I got to catch up if, if we at all felt yeah. like we were not keeping up with ourselves, right? Yeah. I, I do feel I've had um, two moments in my career where I stepped away for a year mm-hmm. um, and not because of injury um, one was to do on the town and right. I, I didn't really do point work that year because to do point shoes and then wear heels at night and dance mm-hmm. in the heels, I just felt was really dangerous for my, my, my midfoot. Um, okay. so I chose to really, like, I barely put on my point shoes that year. And then as I came back to the ballet, I kind of trained like a student again, like the, the couple months <laughs> leading up, I, yeah, I attended, I attended this, the SAB summer course and I went, I took a class a day in my point shoes before my Broadway show that night to really train to get back and, and it worked out wow. fine. And then I, I had a baby and I actually came back faster than I ever expected. And um, when I first put on my point, you know, I stopped, I probably stopped putting my point shoes in July and then I put them back on again in January after I had my baby in November and I wore them around the house for a little bit just to get the bones right. and the skin used to it. And then I put them on and it was rocky. But once you really get going, it's like a month later and you're okay. So I'm not super afraid to take yeah. some space. Um, but I yeah. also know, you know, you got to do so- some stuff every day. So I'm, I'm doing right. that. Choose two exercise things a day. That's kind of where I'm at right now. That's so great. I love, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm loving listening to how disciplined you are. I mean, it's no surprise. And I'm sure, you know, I know that dancers also have to have like a very, a, a, a serious discipline. I mean, we all do, um, but it's so neat to hear your, your process. Um, are you singing every day? What is going on with you? I'm not singing every day, but I wouldn't have sung every day beforehand either. Okay. Um, okay. I'm a big, like you, I'm a big, like, Hey, let's take a break. <laughs> yeah. So I'll take a break. Um, and I'll, I'll warm up and I've been teaching, which has been really fun and interesting for me. Um, so I will, 
I find that within the teaching, after a few hours of teaching, I have to actually kind of do a little bit of my own warm ups and get my play, get my voice back into my body because I've spent uh-huh. hours trying to um, evoke like muscular or non muscular movement for a student in order for them to either release or you know do it's whatever. the same in, in ballet you know you're trying to demonstrate and show something yeah. and then my body will actually really hurt after I teach a class so right. you have to then right. then do you. Exactly. You have to kind of undo perhaps the things that you were trying to over express in order for them to catch a kernel. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) That's been fascinating, but it's also a a big teaching moment for us as well. I think, I think anytime you teach your own craft, you know, you learn more about it and you also learn how to explain it more. And and, And in a selfish way, it's really for your benefit. Yeah. I, I learned, I've, I think I've improved throughout my career because I've taught more and more and things you take for granted, the, the knowledge of something to have to break it down and explain it to someone. It makes you realize, right. You, you understand it better yourself and then you hold yourself to it because once you've said something to someone, you're not going to go and not do it yourself. Like you really commit, (laughs) you, you commit to those ideas better and that, um, that makes you better in your craft for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's so true. I love that. Like, basically, you follow your own, you know, practice what you preach, right? Practice. Exactly. You like, um, I, I have this guilty feeling while I'm dancing <laughs> after I teach, like, I got to do what I told them because those girls, I, they come and watch the ballet. And so. Right. No, I, I completely know what you mean. I, I, I had, you know, I was teaching, I, when I was doing, the last thing I did was a concert for the New York Philharmonic here. And there were um, a handful of Juilliard ladies who were singing in a piece in, a, in another part of the program. And uh, they had come to see the concert because they could, after they had sung, they went into the audience. And then I ended up teaching them virtually in a sort of like a week long, sort of two week long virtual um, Juilliard residency that I just finished. And uh, we were chatting about the piece that I had done. And of course I was thinking, oh God, did I do what I'm trying to get them to do right now? Did I do it? Did I do it? <laughs> you know, Sometimes I find myself pretty- saying, now don't do what I just did. Do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> don't do what I just did. Do what I'm trying to get you to do. <laughs> yeah. I, know. I know that feeling. So there was a question from Fernanda Guzman who asked if you had any role models growing up. Or do you obviously still still do? Or what were who are the dancers? Or, or it doesn't even have to be dancers, obviously. But yeah. who are the people that you um, um, admired, looked, looked up to? When I was growing up, I... I grew up in Utah, so I really looked up to the principal dancers at Ballet West. Mm -hmm. Um, And I didn't know anything about New York City Ballet or any bigger things. Like, I really am not, didn't grow up, like, idolizing Darcy Kistler and all of these big names like everybody um, knew about. I was very, like, just, like, all about my hometown and and knowing about them. And then I came out to New York and realized I didn't know anything. And... (laughs) um, and, and then when I got into the company, I found myself um, really looking up to the dancers that were not only, you know, they were principals in the company and, and beautiful, amazing dancers with so many wonderful qualities. But the reason I admired them is because of their personalities and the way they conducted themselves as human beings um, throughout the day. Mm. Um, in rehearsal, out of rehearsal, how they treated people. Um, that was seemed to be what m- made me feel like, um, most inspired. I, I wasn't like, wow, look at that dancing. I, I want, I felt like anytime I could look up to someone that still was a, a good human and didn't let the art take over them and you know you know you we've all seen people be divas and sure. have their moments in rehearsal where something's not going well and they kind of like have this intense moment and, and everyone kind of like you know <laughs> right um I was really <laughs> turned off by that and yeah. I I really looked up to the people that could deal with the stress in a graceful way so that's that's kind of who I ended up looking up to so for me it was Jenny Ringer who now teaches at a pre-professional school in Southern California called the Colburn. 
and um, and then Yvonne Boré. They were both principals with New York City Ballet when I was there, and and they kind of took me under their wing, and they and they said to me, they were like, "We can tell you have a good head on your shoulders, and stick with us." And and I felt like we had a little group of sanity, and I I needed yeah. that. I I it was important to me whenever I saw like a ballet ballerina like on a gig if we were together eat a normal meal someone that I thought looked so extreme and I was like oh my gosh they must have like no life and like they just dance all day long and don't eat anything and then I would see them eat like a bacon egg and cheese I was like wow (laughs) so like (laughs) as I got older to seeing people just be regular that was that was the inspiring thing to me I I liked knowing and feeling that you know, we're still normal and that otherwise it's not sustainable, but from really far away, it kind of looks like such an intense lifestyle. And that made me really nervous. So I I grasped on to the, yeah, it absolutely, it looks looks like like that, right? It does. Well, and it does. That's why it's so fascinating for me to talk to you and to really get the kind of nitty gritty about it. And I'm sure that everybody's experience, you know, is going to be different. Like, you know, I, I only have like a very small, you know, group of dancer friends, like between you and now I know Adrian Clay and, and Guillaume Cote. And I, I, I'm not, um, close with Sarah, but I met her recently and she's also really fantastic. Oh, that's right. and I know you guys are, and I know you guys are really close. So, um, yeah. so yeah, again, we're like, funny because uh, we uh, have com- completely different approaches. She is really like, um, you know, I think very, most of the people I know are, are normal, normal okay. eaters, but in terms of like, I need to get into a studio and I need to work. She is like 10 times different than I am. Like she, she's not taking a break right now. She is like, I'm, I'm, I'm still working hard. So. I can, I can imagine. I mean, I, I obviously, because I, you know, because I know you and when we, when you had your baby, we were talking a lot about that. And, and to anybody who's curious, um, Megan is the one that introduced me to her physical therapist because oh. I, in our conversations, remember, and I was talking about the diastasis recti, the sort of separation of the abdominal muscles after pregnancy, how I had said, I really think that I still have this eight years later. And so I it? went to, it's, it's better. It's better. Yeah. It's do you have, do you have close, the brace? It's better. I do. Did you get the I brace? Do. I know. I, I just, I just bought a new one. I, yeah. I got I got rid of mine. It was so overly worn and the Velcro wasn't like <laughs> attaching anymore. And I thought, oh, I can do without it. I think I'm in this place. I don't need it anymore. And um, I think I do. I really, I like the way it pulls you together and cues your body. Um, and I, I, well, I, I like the exercises. It's, like, it's a cue, right? It, it's, it's, it becomes, it becomes after that, just in case you've been gone for two weeks, you know, or something, you get back into it or something. But like we were saying, how does that help your singing? So for me, what I've noticed, um, because the muscles did not come back together completely. So this is, this is something that happens, right. For anybody who doesn't know, like in pregnancy, right. The baby stretches those front, the muscles, and you're going to know more about the anatomy than I am because that's what you do. Right. But so you could probably explain it better than me. Right. But the, basically the abdominals in the front, like that, that midsection, right. Up and down, passing the belly button basically opens and, and stretches and a lot of it's times almost like come, a hernia. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so a lot of times it will come back. Right. But a lot of times it doesn't fully come back together. Or I think what it is, is that there's some people where it doesn't spread that way. Like I had a friend in the ballet yeah. world, her six pack stayed together and everything on the outside stretched out. But oh. for me, the, that those two columns of muscles in the front is where my belly expanded. And, and so for her, her, it literally, hers all stayed together. Isn't that strange? I so she didn't, yeah, she didn't have a problem with it. So I think for everybody is it's different, but if you do have that separation of those muscles, you have to work to get it back. And what I found really, um, uh, creating to me was that, right. uh, the idea of like the mommy pooch doesn't have to exist. It's like, I think people see someone that's that have had that's had a baby, and they think um, th- their body will never be the same. And it they've they've lost weight and they've gotten back into their regular shape. But the fact is that the muscles have not repaired themselves. And so, if you do these exercises and you brace your your stomach and you work the transverse abdominals, which they go from it's like the height of your belly button. And it's from your spine wrapping all the way to the front of the belly button. And that's what these exercises trigger. Um, 
to get the two columns of front abdominal muscles closer and closer together. And, right. and I just feel like, wow, if more people knew that that's the thing that makes your body look different after having a baby and that it's pretty fixable, I, I, I think that's a you know, really empowering thing for people to have that knowledge because it's nice yeah. to feel like you, you get to look like you always did. Yeah, absolutely. Or at least, and also not to mention just the ricochet, kind of like the domino effect of having muscles that aren't totally functioning the way they should, especially in your abdomen, right? Because that ultimately right. protects your back, it right. protect, you know, and then it continues the domino effect throughout the rest of your system, right? No, for me, for singing, it was very interesting. And I actually now, even if I don't put the brace on, I'll put a, a scarf around my waist and I'll tighten it. And I've done my own sort of version of it at this point where I basically tighten it and I just tie it. So I have my hands free um, and I do the first like 30 minutes of my warm ups, kind of, in that sort of place. Yeah, just with that little cue. Yeah, just to keep on reminding me, just keep, it's like basically keep that engagement at all times because I, yeah. learned, how to, I learned how to sing from a dancer's core because I had danced all up through when oh, I got to Juilliard. And was Which singing. is the wrong way to sing, right? <laughs> right. So through <laughs> all of that, I had to learn how to actually relax my, my stomach muscles basically. Yeah. A little, let them go. a little bit, right? Yeah. So that I wasn't shallow breathing. Yeah. So it was this whole process. And then I had a baby and it was all like. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, now I clearly don't know how to breathe at all. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I did want to. That's the other thing you, about pregnancy. Um, yeah. You learn how to breathe properly because when your belly's so big, you have to. Um, I learned t- uh, in order to also protect those stomach muscles. Um, that anytime you do any effort, like when you're pregnant, effort is like standing up from the couch, that you exhale with the effort. And I really, um, I really started to, yeah, started (laughs) to connect my, my breathing to my movement in a way that I never Mm -hmm. understood before. And I thought that was really valuable. Well, I'm sure it just also continued to inform within your dancing, because you're going to make motions that you would have breathed through anyway, but it has even more of a functional effect perhaps to it. Yes. Right? Like, yeah. 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 Oh, I love that. That's so fascinating. <laughs> I, the next time I do anything with singing, I'm like, Oh wait, but I need to inhale. Cause I have a phrase coming. No exhale. exhale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start, I'm going to start getting all crazy about it. <laughs> like, no, let's exhale. My stomach needs the support. Um, that's so, funny. That's so, funny. so you did mention food before, which uh, is has always been a subject of conversation for me because I love food. Um, and I'm always talking to people, especially right now, like what are they cooking in, in their quarantined homes and, and everything. But maybe you could talk a little bit about that on the fun side. But also you did hint a little bit at the diet sort of or the, the food habits, I think, of dancers. And I'm, I'm still really curious because I know everybody's so different. And how, yeah. have you, how have you navigated that? Because you're so... Um, like you said, you really do have an amazing head on your shoulders, you know, and you're really, um, I mean, you're so smart and you're so, um, aware, right. So I can only imagine you, you're, you would have an amazing kind of experience through all of that as well. I think when I was, you know, new in the company, it was this thing where you're learning how, much of a normal human being you get to be and still be a professional ballet dancer. And so I remember at first even being afraid to tell people, like, I went and hung out with friends. Like, that was, like, Uh something that was, you know, that could have been taxing on my body. And, like, I remember hearing people in PT complain about something and feeling like there would be judgment on any extracurricular activities they had done that might have caused their body to be, oh. you know, like, like your whole day, it's not just your eating, it's your whole day of movement is, is now dictated by trying to be healthy for the ballet. And, and when you're really, really, um, you know, young, you're like feeling like you're not allowed to be yeah. a human being. So anyways, that kind of, you know, it ties into the eating too. Like, am I allowed to like have a normal meal? And, um, when I was an apprentice, I got a, a weight talk and I actually weigh exactly the same now as I did then. And I weighed that exact same amount when I got promoted to principal. So looking back, I realized it wasn't so much like an, a weight number as it was. I mean, first of all, you get in the company going through puberty and 
everybody's bodies are like weirdly swollen and they see you in a leotard and tights every day and they have this thing. They want to make sure that you know the standard that you have to keep to stay competitive. Um, And no one ever said anything like don't eat. It was like, um, maybe it's like cookies or something you could cut out or I don't know if you drink sugary sodas. And I'm like, no, well, I eat a lot of cookies actually. (laughs) But um, <laughs> this is um, why I could never was, ever ever be a dancer, aside from all the other reasons. But like, no, but like, you can no, eat ah. cook. You can eat cookies, and then and long story yeah. short, after you know, probably over restricting myself, trying to make sure I could fit in and still be accepted, I went probably too far, and you know, even kind of probably hurt my hurt my foot from it because you have to have strength to to dance well. Um, I, I ended up realizing it's all about balance and just, you know, not going too far. And the way I kind of look at what we do is that you should be thinking of yourself to be an Olympic type shape. And I never look at an Olympic athlete and think that they must be starving themselves. They're fine. They've fine tuned everything about their body, what they put into their body, how they worked it out during the day, how they rested it and took care of it. And the PT they gave it, the physical therapy they, they give themselves and all that self-care. So that's how I kind of evolved to start thinking about it. It's not like a sacrifice that you don't get to sit on the couch and eat donuts. Like, and, and the way that I, I look at it is that once you get your body to this place where it does feel really fine-tuned, you don't really want to go back because you feel good. So when you do find that place of balance, it's addicting. You don't want to ever be unbalanced again. And, and you commit to those disciplines and habits and they become just the regular you. So it just, it takes years to figure out what works for you and everybody's different. Um, and you know, for me, I'm actually like a person that does really well. If I get on the scale every morning and I know a number, then I don't worry about it all day long. And I think because for dancers, we spend the entire day in front of a mirror. So you could get really weirdly in your head. Like sometimes mirrors are bad mirrors or skinny mirrors or like, you know, and then like, you're like looking like, do I look out of proportion compared to the people around me? Like you get really weird in your head. And for me, it made me the most normal to just be like, what's my number on the scale this morning? And uh, whatever I did the day before, did that serve me? Well, okay, good. I'm staying in the good zone. And, and it, it's really about coming down to it. When you get off the stage and you've, you've finished a performance, I, I ended up realizing I had moments w- when I was really young where I was like, oh, wow, I didn't eat enough before that. Mm-hmm. And then I had moments where I was like, wow, you cannot eat dinner before you put on a tutu. So it was just all these little experiences right. that taught me what, what right. I um, needed to succeed and nothing, none of it feels like a sacrifice. It's just, um, right. it's, it's that balancing act. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It takes time as well. I think sometimes the unfortunate truth yeah. is that sometimes you have to go kind of through the pendulum swing to really find your, your totally. midpoint, right? Totally. Yeah. 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 But it's, yeah, it's definitely, I mean, like food. I mean, I remember because, you know, I was, I went to Juilliard and Adrian and I realized this the other day that we were there at the same time and that in fact were you because I was there then yeah I mean, he I stayed we were, in SAB one year later than me but right I think we were all there around the same time and what's crazy is I remember seeing like if I go back into like the phyllo facts of my memories I feel like I remember seeing a young Adrian walking the halls you know because we would all share kind of that downstairs area and then the cafeteria yeah. of course right where yeah you know, we would always be, we would always be watching, like, what are the dancers eating? Like, and because we would also feel like in the cafeteria at the time, we're like, what could they possibly eat here that is also healthy for them? You know, so much. But, you know, in the the same breath, you, you need fuel. And that's the thing is that if you went out to dinner with a bunch of dancers after they did a show, I think you would, people would be shocked at how much we eat. Like, it's more about the timing of when we eat it. You know, it's, it's, you, you have to be very calculated the day so that you constantly have energy, but you're not too overly, you know, like weighed down, like, you know, who wants to put a leotard on after a big lunch, right? So I eat a lot of small meals throughout the day. Sure. 
And then, and then more like a bigger dinner at the end of the night. But um, I, I've always it's noticed. It's sort of like people, the way we eat as well. Yeah. I, I've noticed that people are surprised at how much dancers do eat. But, I mean, we're dancing all day long. so It's a lot. I mean, you do, and you do have to eat. So that's why I'm always. You, just you have to like, refuel. Yeah. Because you know, the next day exciting. you're back at it and you have to push your body again and expect right. it to give great output. But um, in terms of what I'm cooking right now. Oh, um, yeah. we do, we do blue aprons um, oh, okay. here and I got it for four servings because I'm with my parents. Right. Um, and then I've been doing like a lot of biscotti because oh. I, I had gotten into this habit of getting like an afternoon coffee at Starbucks across the street from Lincoln Center. And I like sweets, so I always got a little something. Right. And um, sometimes it would be biscotti and you dip it in your coffee. And, and so I'm making it now and... I there it's gone within the day. I love not it. not just me, not just me. It's the whole household, but um, they. What I'm saying is they're tasty. They're <laughs> They've so been good successful. Stuff. That's so. I love that. That's really. Yeah. That's so yum. And they are really so good. Like a good biscotti, like a little coffee. Like I feel like it's a nice little um, like ritual. It's not yeah. just a cook a cookie. It's like it's you know yeah. taking a moment out of your day, <laughs> Gonzalo. <laughs> God, you love biscotti. <laughs> well, anyways, maybe if you tried one of mine, you would know. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. I want you should decide. Well, when you come to New York and when we can eventually see each other in person. We'll have to do it together. We'll have to have some biscotti and coffee or something or another. Sounds good. I know. Yeah, we have, we have to do it. I know. I know. Eventually, right before both children are in college. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's a good goal <laughs> I mean it gives us a little bit of time <laughs> yeah <laughs> we don't have to feel too rushed or anything you know? <laughs> oh my goodness but um that's, that's so cool and so I'm glad and so everybody at home is well and healthy and um, yeah yeah cool. we're doing really well here um I just wonder like when I finally make it back to New York am I gonna just get sick just getting back I don't know I just feel like right I mean, I, at some I don't, point I have to get back. So, right. I mean, I well, guess I don't know, you know, I don't, I mean, we're obviously fine, but we haven't been out. Um, you know, if I do end up having to go out to a market at some point or another, I'm going to wear my mask and I have like goggles. <laughs> oh my God. And I'm going to be, that, I'm going to be that person, you know, and I'm, I don't I, care. I think I'm that just this go is the time. This is the time to be that person. Have you followed yeah. this Instagram called subway creatures? No, but I know it. I know. I mean, I know what you're talking about. With all of the crazy gear that people have been wearing. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. I've been... I'm like, are these Photoshopped? I mean, it's incredible. I like, love seeing someone with like, like a full <laughs> thing with the gas mask thing and the, the like garbage bag or like the ones that have like plastic bags with the yes. little hand looped on their ears. <laughs> I mean, I it's good. good. We should all be doing what we can. <laughs> love it. I love these last two questions, actually. So one is, okay. what do you drink to stay hydrated? And then I like how um, Barry is saying, <laughs> how's the ice cream situation? Because I love ice cream. But so but how do you stay hydrated? I'm actually curious because I don't think I drink enough water. And for singers, that's also really bad. Like we have to stay I, yeah. very hydrated. Right. <clears throat> I don't drink enough water either. I like <laughs> my co my coffee in the morning. And then I look forward to my second coffee at like one o'clock or right. three. <laughs> I have to have it before like four okay. and then just so I can sleep. And then, and then, you know, it's dinner time and it's time for a glass of wine, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I really have to like make an effort to drink water. Um, when yeah. I'm dancing, it's not so much of a problem. I'm just thirsty. So right. I, I'm carrying a, I, I did learn a good habit while I was pregnant to just always carry a water bottle with you, which is kind of hard in New York. Cause that seems like, when you're in New York and you're just like going through the subway or whatever to like have a whole hand dedicated to a water bottle feels like really <laughs> a commitment. It's a, lot. It's a commitment. <laughs> or even sometimes in the middle of the season, I'm like, I don't, if I have a bag, like to put the weight of water in it, I'm like, that is going to hurt my back. And I don't want my back to get tired today right. because I have a show tonight or something. So, um, that's how I think of water more. So I, I like always like trying to think, how do I have to not carry this somewhere? <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. But, um, 
But no, we're supposed to drink a lot of water as dancers. I'm always trying to get something that has um, sodium in it, like electrolytes, not right. just potassium and magnesium, but for me, sodium, because I have really low blood pressure. And I think a- athletes tend towards really low blood pressure. The more you exercise, the lower right. your blood pressure is. But hereditarily, I have low blood pressure. So oh, right. I, get, I can get lightheaded very easily mm-hmm. if I stand up quickly or something. Or even like I've been like, I just do a port de bras back at, at a ballet bar and I can right. get lightheaded. So I'm always trying to like have a Gatorade somewhere or some type of like electrolyte situation to like up my sodium. I I put lots of salt on things. Oh, wow. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Oh yeah. Yeah. The water, water. Mm -hmm. I try to get up in the morning and drink like 20 ounces of water with lemon juice or something in it, you know? Um, Yeah. Lemon juice is great in the morning. Yeah. 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 And then I tend to forget to drink until like dinner. I do the same yeah. thing. I do yeah, the same it's thing. terrible. But I also forget to eat in the middle of the day as well. That's but that's well, been that's been me since I was a little girl. I, so I don't forget that. I don't forget that. <laughs> but <laughs> um, uh, for dancers, like you don't want to drink too much water before you dance because the worst thing in the world is to hear the stomach going <laughs> whoosh when you're jumping. So I tend to just like I drink a ton of water after a rehearsal. But uh-huh. before, I, I really try to keep away from that. And even right before the show happens, like, I try to limit my water, um, like, at least, like, like I'm paying attention, like, an hour and a half or an hour before the ballet starts, did I get as much water as I want? Because I'm going to start to now. I'm not going to have any chugging moments that hour before the curtain goes up because you just, you, you can't be light on your feet if you have, like, a stomach full of water. So Right, right. That's, yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess we feel the same way. Not just maybe about water singers are kind of always drinking water, but like for, at least for me and food, like I, I won't eat a big meal right before a show. I'll eat, right. I'll have like my biggest meal between like four and five before an eight o'clock yeah. show so that I go in feeling kind of empty in a way, but with energy. Yeah, me too. And then at the end, Sometimes mine's more like, like th- three elements. o'clock. I'll do like three o'clock yeah. and then like an eight o'clock show just because... I don't know why. If, if it's a nice big meal, you need time to digest. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And like you said, well, and, and you guys even more so, but like anytime you put a corset on or anything, you know, you go up. I don't know how you guys do that because you guys look so amazing, but you do have to expand your stomach as you sing. So at least for me, like I, I'm, I don't love singing corsets, but I've, I've figured out over the years, like what f- works best for me. And, and do you leave a little room? Yeah. So what's best is like when you have a good relationship with the costume department, as you probably know, it's probably the same. And you go in and you say, you know, hey, can we just make sure that the waist is low? Like, so for me, the tightest point of the waist for a corset to continue making it look like it's being cinched in has to be really low for me. And then Uh you can really cinch it in and it won't bother. Because you don't like that's that's for dancers, too. I can't have that waistband anywhere on a rib cage. Yep. Like it has to be nice and low. And, and sometimes yeah. even the psoas muscle, if the waist is too tight, it'll kick on my psoas muscle in my back. And I feel like my back get, would, used to get kind of spasmy. So yeah, yep. those are funny little things. It's funny because it's exactly the same for me. So, and also I'll say to the costume department, I was like, can we just make sure? So like in a place like the Met where they're so fantastic, they know already. They have me, like I come into the costume department, they're like, you're wearing a corset. And I'll be like, oh boy. And they're like, we know you like a long waist. We know, like, we, we got you. <laughs> I don't think, um, like, people in the audience got, know do. how tight these costumes are. I don't, I don't think people yeah. really know. Like, there is no comfort <laughs> level about what you're wearing up there for a no, tutu no. or for, yeah. Yeah, generally not. I mean, I don't know about you guys if you ever wear the corsets as well, but, like, if you do, do you ever do elastic laces? Um, we are not really wearing corsets so much. I think that's more like right. in Russian tutus. They're having uh-huh. like elastic stuff like that. Right. But, um, our stuff is incredibly stiff. It's mm. really hard to do arabesque at first. It's really mm. shocking. Like it's not a s- simple situation. Like you put your costume on and if it's a brand new costume, you're, you're begging the people to put you into a, you know, into into rehearsal with the costume because you have to have the right. costume on the rehearsal schedule to get it to yeah. break it in and I need like a couple times in the costume of sweating in it for it right. to kind yeah, of mold, mold to my body but it's like heavy drape material right and it, there's right. nothing thin about the bodice of a tutu so it's really right. kind of it seems backwards but that's what it is yeah well I mean it's funny a lot of people don't don't even know right 
But um, that's so, right. That's so fascinating. Ah, I could talk to you forever about this stuff. It's, I know. It's so fascinating. <laughs> all right, well, I know you also have your baby and you need to get back to your family and all these things. And I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for you to chat with me today. Also, this so has been selfish. fun. I get to see you and talk about the things that we probably never would have talked about really, you know. It's true. You know, it's true. It's, when you know that the audience is listening, you, you have a, a more intellectual conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Please, please stay safe and you too. all my love to you and to everybody. And when you get back into New York, let me know. And at least we can text from a closer distance. <laughs> <laughs> so, or in the same time zone. That'll be better. Or in the same time zone. I know. So we can both wake up at 11. And like, oh. <laughs> so, Sounds um, good. Stay thanks. safe. Enjoy your boy. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Oh. I love Megan. She's the best. So interesting. Ah, I could talk about all of those things forever. It's, I find them fascinating. Thank you again, everybody, for tuning in. I'm really enjoying these chats. Um, and I think that they're, ah, they're just so interesting. They're just so fascinating. So I have a couple. I have some really fun ones coming up this week. I think I'm actually going to have two in a row, Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, and I will let you know, I will try to, uh, post about them soon. If not today, uh, then tomorrow. And, um, and yeah, and I'm going to also try to start posting them on YouTube so that if you miss the chat, you can go back and watch it again. So there's that. I'm trying to get more tech savvy. <laughs> it's taken like a month. Um, so anyway, please stay safe, everybody be well. Uh, stay healthy, wash your hands, and, uh, and I will see you all very, very soon. So sending all my love, and uh, see you later. Bye.